So who here is with a, a station that's in that 30 years or plus category? OK, and what part of the country and uh, call letters? WPRB and Princeton Got it. Uh, CKD Radio in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Mm, wow. KOPN, Okay, cool. Oh, cool. WEFT right here in Champaign. Very lovely. OK. Yes, indeed. Um, and who's with a station that's in that 10 to 30 years old category? OK, and where are you from? Uh, Radio 1 in Prague, Czech Republic. Wow. Got it. <laughs> and, and you, did you raise your hand on that one? No, not so much. OK. Um, and then 10 years or, or younger station? OK, and who's totally just starting out with a station, maybe an LPFM applicant? Right there. Yes, you oh, are. Okay. Yes, OK, cool. cool. I might actually ask you to, um, to talk a little bit later about the model you guys are doing, because it's exciting and originally intended to be part of the session. Um, so uh, this is Kimberly Cronick. Hi, everybody. Yourself. Hi, everybody. It's good to be here. I work at WILL, which is the public TV and radio station. But I want to just give you a little background on my start in radio and how my love for audio developed. Just to, I, I've done a lot of different things. Um, and then talk about engagement and how I got to where I am right now and talk about why you're here and what you want out of the session. I started, my love for audio started really when my grandparents moved from Wisconsin where I grew up to New Mexico and I sent them letters on cassette. And I realized, wow, I really love that. So I actually have these sets for, cassettes from the 70s of my grandmother and myself t communicating. So I realized I really liked that form and then I used to um, pretend uh, to be Mr. Rogers and I used to do fake shows or read the news to nobody, just nobody. And then um, I uh, got worked for newspapers, my college newspaper. I w was a story uh, writer and then ended up working at a community paper after that, a black paper. And then I got a um, job in commercial TV and got fired after 10 months. Um, our politics didn't match. Uh, I was doing a kid's show, actually, and they didn't like the geopolitical context that I was bringing to that program. They thought it was, you know, they didn't need to know about Beijing, even though the soccer team was going to Beijing and Beijing had just, you know, Tiananmen Square had just blown up. So that didn't last too long. But I did find a home in public broadcasting. But when I got here, I also knew before I got here about WEFT, the community radio station. And they had a long running program called Women Making Waves. It's programming by women, about women's music, news, comedy. It's gone for many, many years. So I quickly, uh, while I was working at WILL, um, started to volunteer and pr program that show. It was run by a woman who was doing it year after year just to keep it going. It was the longest running show on WEFT actually, one of the longest ones. And, sh and so we said, well, let's form a collective. Let's not burn anyone out and form it. So we kind of had a collective and I did that for about eight years. I was on the board of the programming committee. I was on the um, board of directors as well. And then um, at the same time, the IMC was kind of getting going here. So I did a little bit of freelance work on the open publishing on the website, kind of taking my journalism skills and doing some stories that other people weren't doing. Um, did some civil disobedience, got arrested, was on the front page of the paper, all this while I'm at WILL. Um, and then, so, my, so I, what I want to say is the, the reason I got into radio was I had a story to tell and I wanted to have other people's stories that weren't told be told. So it was both a love as well as a, a sense of, of I want to help these stories get out there. Now I oversee news and content, and um, my work is about partnerships, which was talked about at the last meeting. It's about partnership. It's about being an organization that spans boundaries. It's about um, working together to make different points of view heard. It's a little bit different. It's not for a particular uh, cause per se, but it's to say, let me give a voice to everyone and let people make up their mind. So I've got. So I just wanted you to know a little bit about my history. And when I first did radio, I just thought it was enough to just have that voice that was different on the air. Now I think um, that, and what public radio does and TV, for the last 10 years, we've been trying to turn more outward. There's actually been a movement to do that, to say, the programming decisions that we make are not just made by people inside the building, but how do we know what it is? We have a news hole to fill. We have so many hours of radio to programming that's local to fill, so many hours of TV. What decisions drive what we put in there? 
and how can the decision making of our station include other voices. So that's the work I do now. And I have some examples to show you, um, but before I continue to talk, 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 I thought maybe we can move into some interactive stuff to find out more about what you're here, what you'd like to talk about, and then I'm sure all of us here have examples that fit into that. But my first, I just wanted to communicate that turning outward, whether it's a grassroots situation like WEFT where it's almost all volunteers, or the IMC, or an organization where we have 50 employees, I think it's really hard. It's really hard to get out of your routine. And so what I've done in my career now, or in my life history, a lot of my work now is about taking the institution and trying to turn it outward. That's, that's been my, my work. Um, so that's why I'm excited to talk about engagement. Seven years ago when we started to look at it, our whole model shifted from a push media to a pull media. And that's what that means to me. Engagement is two-way. And we have some examples to show you, but um, maybe we could find, I could find out what, why you're here. Why did you want to come to a panel on game? What do you hope to get, to get out of it? Anybody? Yes. Um, we have a low power FM station, a uh, small, very small core of volunteers. And what we're interested in doing is, is uh, getting content created by the institution, not the institutions, the organizations, the nonprofits, the peace and justice organizations within our community so that they would come that they would provide a lot of, uh, be able to provide the content. And we're interested in airtime because the idea that we could control our station from a lot of different places um, in the community rather than right near the transmitter. Um, and so the reason I came here is I'm interested in the strategies for getting uh, organizations that we, um, finding the people that are in, in organizations that want to create media. To, mm -hmm. to get mm -hmm. Yeah, I, we've had mixed success on that, actually. Um, <laughs> we have done workshops where we teach people, uh, where we've trained them to meet you know, certain broadcast standards that we have, which are all different and different types of broadcasters. And um, I find it, it's difficult to do, actually do that. The most success we've had is in working with youth. When we work with an organization that already has youth that come there on a regular basis, whether it's a Boys and Girls Club, we worked with the Boys and Girls Club in Danville, whether it's the schools that have you know, kids that go there every day, whether it's, um, uh, and those are the two examples we worked with. So when, so the media organization for us needed to find a strong partner that has youth there. So then we say, what, what is it that you're doing with your youth? And we help them see how media can be part of what their goals are with you, okay? So that's how we approach, but we need as a media organization that constant flow. So then we go in and we say, you know, either what tools do you have? Is it your cell phone? Is it uh, freeware, Audacity? You know, what, we, talk, we talk to them about how we can help them tell stories with the tools they already have. Or if we get a grant, for example, if we got a lot of flip cams, you know, um, or we have other div audio recording devices, we've used that. But for us, the key is youth. They, they, uh, that's been our most success. We've done blogging workshops. You know, we have a, a community blog. Um, we've had some success there. We've also tried to be aware of who's already doing what, who's already kind of doing that, and see if we can bring them to us. Um, but I find that it's important to be really clear what you can offer and what you re need back. So for us, that's been important with um, any relationship that we have. Um, maybe we could just get a little bit more of a sense of, of the room. Uh, does that work? Yeah. And uh, yeah. a table question for, for just right now. Um, so who does their work with an intentional community engagement plan? Raise your hands. Okay. Great. Who is looking to build and flesh out that plan? Yeah, well, okay. all right. Okay, there's okay. so a mix of folks here, folks mm -hmm. doing stuff, folks mm -hmm. um, who do totally doesn't have a plan. <laughs> like, no plan. <laughs> but but is thinking about a plan. <laughs> yeah, don't, I mean, this is, I mean, it's good. You're thinking about a plan. I mean, that's like the first step in a plan. Okay. Well, uh, I would like to share this. At Main Street Project, 
what we want is the community to feel that the radio is part also of them mm -hmm. and make a connection and um, n not only think of that there is commercial radio but there is also this community involvement and get together as uh, because of the ethnicities, the languages, the the uh, old Minneapolis that we have in St. Paul that to come together as one. Mm -hmm. And that's our one of our main uh, projects is that the listeners can we all share together that we have many in common interests that we're community we're a community and we got we want to come together as one. And for me that's one of the purpose that uh, communities see not only the commercial, but we want them to, to feel part of this amazing project that uh, Main Street is getting involved in, in you know, hooking us uh, Latino and Hmong community and Somalian community, African American community. And that's one of my, my uh, you know, projects that I, I still don't have that idea, like how are we gonna do it? Like <laughs> make this one possible big mm -hmm. together like uh, magnets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, are you with Main Street Project yourself or with one of the one community of organizations? The community organization, yes. Which one? Uh, I'm part of Mujeres en Liderazgo and I'm also in the air with uh, KF AI, mm -hmm. La Voz del Pueblo, mm -hmm. that's in Spanish, mm -hmm. so there's mm -hmm. a lot of work to do there. Mm -hmm. I know there's one other person at least um, in this crowd, Adrian, uh, who's with uh, the Minneapolis St. Paul thing. Now, are you with a specific organization right now? Yeah. A person who shows up at some of these meetings. Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. Okay. Awesome. Anyone else working on this this project with Main Street Project in Minneapolis, St. Paul? Yeah. Okay, just curious. <laughs> cool. Um, yes, uh, Danielle McCauley, who's with uh, Main Street Project, can't be with us today, but uh, maybe we can talk a little bit more about how that's been going. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, maybe I shouldn't introduce myself. Yeah, we didn't oh, do that. That's a good idea. Yeah, this is. <laughs> I'm going to uh, time myself because I don't want to over talk about this. But, uh, oh, that's a little, wow. Um, can you clear that somehow? <laughs> um, so my name is Sabrina Roach, and I've been working in community and public media for about 11, 11 years now. Um, I started off at an NPR affiliate in Seattle that I've been listening to since I was like 15 when I found it, like in the middle of the night. <laughs> Yeah, you know, on the radio between my wall and my bed that I had there. Um, up to that point, my family, we were, we were commercial radio AM listeners. Someone in our church uh, had a radio show and we would listen to that, although, although it was not a religious show, um, uh, in the mornings, that whole thing. And I, you know, I loved radio. So um, what I loved about this, this NPR affiliate in Seattle, KUOW, is that they had this arts programming that was really great. It was really my way to connect with creative communities in Seattle that, that, that I had no idea about. And I had a dream about working with them someday. So I did finally get there. But um, while there, uh, there had been a broadcasting conference in Seattle. And I learned, I began to learn about Prometheus. And I began to learn that, that there was something in addition to the NPR style, uh, community radio and uh, that I could get access to training at our local community radio station. And that's how I got involved there. I took a, a writing for radio class, mm -hmm. um, then became an underwriting representative, <laughs> and then to supplement my you know, income at the NPR station, and then became development director at KVCS Community Radio, licensed to Bellevue College, which is just right outside of uh, Seattle. And Donna DiBianco was my, um, my, what did you call that class? Basics of Broadcasting class uh, instructor down mm. at Chaos in Olympia. Mm. Um, so, so I cobbled together my training from these different community resources. And, and I loved the idea that I could kind of pay back into that uh, at KVCS. So I did that for six years, then got offered a job at Brown Paper Tickets. Basically, they support my work um, all over the place in the US and Canada. Just uh, sharing some of my skills and uh, seeing what I can do to pitch in. Um, I feel very fortunate to have this job. It's, it's amazing. Um, 
So uh, we, at, at Brown Paper Tickets, we see uh, community media and college media as, as a part of our ecosystem. Those stations are the kinds of stations that talk about the kinds of events that use our service, like one of the very few places. <laughs> So it's, it's not a, we give this to you, you give something back to us kind of relationship, but we find it, you know, it's, it's just a way to support all of that goodness. Does that make sense? Um, plus, our CEO, just, he, just loves, he just loves it, so I'm not going to fight that. Um, you know, Kim talked about uh, community engagement. I think those are a lot of my same motivations for, for doing that kind of work. Uh, but at KBCS, I started off with the concept of outreach and uh, didn't know about these notions of community engagement, which takes it further and is more of a with people process than a pushing out process. Um, so with that, uh, I want to hear more from you and what you want to get out of this session so we can really tailor what we're talking about to that. Nan. Okay. In terms yeah. of doing something that's not just having a show. Right. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. That was a mindset shift for me. It took a really long time to understand that's different than, than doing women making waves. Women making waves, yeah, we brought people in, they, we talked about their work and their art and their music, and okay, that's fine. What, what we mean at WL about engagement is listening to the community, literally formally saying, how is the station every month or every week going to be listening to other voices? How are we going to do that? So there's a couple of ways that we do it. One is we either ask organizations, whether they're boys and girls clubs, churches, um, healthcare consumers, whatever, and we say, can we be part of one of your regular meetings? Can we go and can we ask you, what do you aspire for your community? What are the um, aspirations? We want to start with the big picture. Now what blocks, what, what gets in the way of achieving what you want for your community? What, how is the media talking about this in your community? Um, who is involved in this aspiration? Who can make that happen? So we start by literally asking questions and taking notes. That's how we, how we do it. And we have also done it where we've invited the public to come to the station or to the library and we do the same thing where we literally ask a set of questions that are open-ended, we may find within those questions something emerges as sticky, right? Like, okay, hunger. Uh, hunger keeps coming up. No matter who we talk to, hunger comes up. So that tells us as um, engaged and being shoulder to shoulder with the community versus pushing out, it's a shoulder to shoulder, right? Um, is that maybe we should actually um, do some programming on hunger because that's what the community is talking about is a big issue. If we're going to do that, who should be our partners? And what are, we going to, what are we going to talk about? And what is the purpose? Are we going to just tell stories? Or are we going to be a pathway for people who are already working on the issue? Can our stories and our content further connect them or connect new people to that movement? And then, you know, depending on how long we want to be in the game, right, we hope that when, we're, when we stop mm, covering that so intensely that something's changed, it's catalytic because we were there. So I'll give you two examples. We've done days of broadcast, we've done three now in the last year. These all came out of listening first. We did one on hunger, we did one on housing, and we just did one on local food, which had some elements of food justice in it. And we're going to continue. We, we didn't just drop these themes now, we continue. We put them on our talk show. We put them on our NPR, you know, our news stories. We put them on this Will Connect website, if someone could pull that up. Um, and we put resources. We say, if you want to find, um, if you want to buy, if you want to support a local farmer who's growing vegetables and not corn and soybeans, here's how you can directly contact this farmer and buy it. Or you can go to your farmer's market or whatever. Or housing, you need to know, uh, what do you do? I've lost my income, I need a housing. Okay, well. We provide look up housing. Here's a self help center. They'll connect you to, to housing. So, so that's so. So it's about tapping into something that's already there, bringing the storytelling, the convening, the facilitating skills of the staff on at WILL or elsewhere, being involved 
to infuse energy, which then takes directions that we don't know. We don't know exactly where they go. But we have faith that through that work, through that model, that something is different. So that's, that's, that's the way that we've been doing it. I'll give you another really, I think, important story. This was in 2003. Um, you know, there are, there are lots of organizations and people doing great work. And sometimes they offer grants. And they have analyzed and they've said, look, this is an issue. We want you to focus on health. OK, so we got one of those, 2003. And it said, tell us a community health need and how you're going to partner and how you're going to um, be with the community on this need. So what we did is we invited different organizations to WL. We had Champaign County Healthcare Consumers. We had Francis Nelson Medical Center. It's a, a clinic, a health clinic. We had Champaign County Healthcare Consumers, if you don't know, it's a social activist group, not a, a social uh, service, social activist group. And we had, um, so we all brought them in separately and we asked them questions and they all said, to our amazement, access to dental health, to dental, access to dental care and oral health. We had no idea. We didn't know healthcare consumers was getting 70 calls a month about, I don't know what to do with my teeth. We had no idea, we found out two years earlier, the Surgeon General, for the first time, did a report on oral health and access to healthcare. We didn't know that. We didn't know that um, kids miss more school because of dental issues than other issues. We had no idea. So we said, okay, this, this is something that we can, so we, we said, we needed to partner with an organization and we could partner with a media partner. So we, we decided to partner with this activist group, Champaign County Healthcare Consumers. I had to convince the station that it was okay that if the a director embezzled funds, we would still report on that while we were doing this other thing. And so we said, okay. Plus, they weren't just out there picketing different healthcare organizations. Uh, they were actually, just like the Black Panthers, you think, oh, just one image, right? Afros and rifles. No, they were doing all kinds of stuff in the community. Same thing with healthcare consumers. There was all this other stuff that we didn't know about. Why? Because either we weren't involved or other media were only covering this part of it, right? So I convinced the manager that, that this would be an okay partner to have. And we um, decided we would do a series of stories. And we came up with the name. We also partnered with the only commercial black radio station in downstate Illinois, WBCP. It's been going since 1980. It's still around. We worked with them, we got this grant that helped cover some of our costs, helped cover the, the black station's costs, and we ended up with um, a couple of dental clinics where we had kids come who never had screenings before. So we worked with the community organization on that. We did 12 news stories. Well, we illuminated, we made the problem more visible than it ever was. We um, worked with the Child's Dental Access Group who got dentists involved in giving these free screenings. So we did that. and. We did that for six months, and what we found out happened was several things. One is, we actually won one of the highest journalism awards that you can win, the Murrow Award, for our reporting on this issue. We had uh, over 150 kids screened, some of whom then got connected to these dentists for free care. And we, um, the community, which we hoped after six months that, that again, we would, we would end, but there would be new energy. and the, smilehealthy.org, which was a website that at one time just housed our content, is now the name that the community uses for their dental access to children program. So I would say that was kind of a, a very um, uh, interesting, and, and what the um, person who was running that um, dental access program told us was your reports reached policymakers, which made the county board give more money to our program. So now I can't, in public media, in my role, be an advocate for anything but democracy, for anything but um, a credit, for anything but uh, truth telling. And so, by 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 telling the truth, by by focusing our lens in this way, then the community can do what they want with our content, or with our facilitating, or with our convening. We're not trying to have a specific outcome. We know that that's that's. A legitimate job to do, and that's what we've been doing more and more. Yes. You know, I came to Urbana two years ago for the public meeting camp, and I was kind of shocked that there were a couple of those around the country, and this was the first time that an independent media center had affiliated low power FM, mm. independent bloggers. Did you speak up a little louder? All came, so I came to Urbana a couple. When was this? This is two years ago? Yeah. 
Um, oh. the, uh, yeah. PBS or CBD funded a number of uh, public media camps, which were oh pub camp, yeah, yeah uh, colon like right bar camp style. Like, no, okay, yeah. okay, right. Yeah, so this was the only one I came to that there was any actual community media in represented in the public media yeah. side of things. The rest of them was primarily uh, all CPD funded yeah. employees getting together and talking about what they were doing essentially ignoring what they were doing what's going on. So at that event, there seemed to be interest in covering the same story from different perspectives by the, mm -hmm. reaching out to the communities and these different organizations in the mm -hmm. urban the champagne area of Philly. Did anything ever come from that? Wow, you remember that? Well, that's that was, awesome. I, I thought, well, this is this is a kind of unique thing that actually may have potential to like broaden what public broadcasting actually means to a lot of people. But then I never heard of it. That is such a great, he, what he's talking about is at the end of this pub camp, which is, yeah, it's CPB funded, Andy Carvin, who works at NPR, kind of started this whole thing, they wrote this. It's really for, and when, when, when CPB says public media, they're mostly, I would say, mostly thinking of NPR stations. That's the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Oh, Y'all get that, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so, uh, so Ke Kevin, Kevin, right? Yeah. Kevin was there, some other people were there. Smile Politely, which is a hyper-local blog that we have in town. Um, people from, well, just uh, several people were there. Some uh, people at the university, some people from WEFT were there. And what came out of that was, yeah, what if, what if, what if the, there was a community need that we all agreed was a need? And let's say it's, I'll just say dental care, whatever. Um, how would the different media organizations report on that? And could we coordinate our coverage where for this week, we were all going to take that issue with our own filter, with our own perspective, with our own, the own way we do media, and we were going to cover that. And then we would just do that, just uh, agree on it, cover it, come back and look at our coverage and look at our impact and say, what's different as a result of all that? And it didn't happen. Well, you know what did happen? <laughs> and I don't know if it was inspired by that or if it, you know, just came out of the zeitgeist. But um, CPB then funded in just the last, I don't know when it originated, but it, it came into fruition this, this last year where uh, CPB and the National Center for Media Engagement and a few other partners working with PBS. And I don't, I don't actually know what the NPR component of this is, but I know it's, it's largely like a PBS thing that focused on, um, it's like the, the American Graduate Series, and they focus on youth graduating from high school. And they've been covering this, this issue all around the country. Um, mm -hmm. Stations have aired content mm -hmm. focusing on this. There have been community forums. There's the development of, of political will on the issue. Um, so it's, it sounds like something similar to what you're talking about. But you were talking about what? But those are all CPB funded organizations. Yeah. yeah. And, that, and there's, you know, there's a long history of, of those groups doing cross-reporting, um, which does change the perspective a bit. Like when This American Life covers finances, that's different than what sure. happens when other organizations cover it. But the, when, when members of CPB go to events and talk about putting the public back in public media, which is a common uh, presentation topic for them, they completely ignore the fact that there are other organizations that have been serving the public in public media for years. And so I thought that I was hoping this was an opportunity to say, hey, instead of ignoring these groups that have been serving their local communities for 60 years, evidently, uh, that they could actually work together. But it doesn't sound like that <coughs> happened or has ever happened. This sounds like a really good thing to take to the lunch plenary, I mean, not plenary, but the lunch uh, caucus on, on the future and moving forward. And maybe that's a situation where uh, we can talk about some strategies to, to engage CPB in that, that kind of work. D does that sound good to you? Well, I don't think that there's a lack of effort from people working in community media to reach out to CPB. I think in order for that to get any traction, there has to be a lunch meeting between CPB employees who would be interested in, in actually seeing that happen. But what I was proposing is that we talk about that at the lunch caucus. Is that cool? Sure. Okay. Um, it is definitely worth talking about. Um, Go ahead, Ted. So uh, at, at KCSB, 
we've had programmers who are doing environmental programming. Uh, one of whom still does podcasts. Um, she started it. She had a small little collective, like with her sister and one or two other people. She was the main point person for uh, the sustainability show. There's a strong environmental studies program on campus, uh, and they're kind of. We had uh, some students involved in environmental studies at UCSB. Uh, the sustainability show went off the air because that one person was tired mm. of constantly being responsible for the show each week. Mm. Uh, she had to be there engineering mm -hmm. it. No one else had really taken on that commitment. Uh, so my idea was like, let's try to get the student uh, programmers at, the, at KCSB connected with Jill. Let's see if they can start something collectively like kind of rely on institutional power at our university of like environmental studies program and student activism and then the, what's going on off campus, a permaculture, things like that. And, and then it went on for a year, there was a student kind of point person, uh, but that kind of petered out too. <laughs> and it's, <clears throat> you know, it's like you're here on, as a staff person thinking like, it's just bringing people together, but how do you come up with the tools that actually create something that's sustainable on a radio? <laughs> yeah, that's a good, pro did you want to say that one? Oh, uh, do you have something to say to respond? Yeah. Oh, good. So I'm a student organizer in addition to being a volunteer at our community radio station in Madison. And not that this is really going to help your situation very much, but that is the nature of student organizing. Yeah. The turnover, like you expect that and you plan for it, right? That's the only thing you can do is expect and start early. And the best way you can start early is by training people to recruit other people to and teaching their peers that they're recruiting to their. So I'm a member of United Students Against Sweatshops. And if we were going to partner with work, which we don't at this time, but if we were, um, the way I would go about it is when we recruited new members to our organization, part of their training would be training for the community right now. So you can sort of set up ways to like get people going really quickly, but you have to be meticulous and you have to start right away. You gotta get people, honestly, if you're looking for freshmen and sophomores. Like, by the time they're juniors and seniors, the turnover's too fast, they're too busy. But if you can get people when they're younger, that's how you're going to really engage um, adults. So, so you're talking about how the station really has that responsibility with each new year to build those, those relationships, try and support peer mentorship? I would say, yes, yeah, support peer mentorship. The students that you looked in, like for instance, Crystal and I both come from you know, a student background. We got involved when we were freshmen, and we've been hooked ever since. You know, um, and Despite being incredibly busy going into our final years, we love it. And so we're more than happy to train our peers that we're you know, recruiting or whatever. Um, but I think that it's just prudent of the radio station to be aware of the turnover and to be aware of steps that can be taken to sort of uh, nullify the negative effects of that turnover because it's expected and it's going to happen and there's no way to avoid it. Right, and even as we phase out, we're still the biggest advocate. As we started early, we know how it works. And so we're grabbing people even if we're not there. And so like, okay, we've got to try this out. If we change the strategy, this is how I do things. Can I just add that it's not just in radio that this, this phenomenon happens. I mean, how many of us have started a blog and then you know the, the last post is, gee, I'm really sorry that I haven't blogged in the last six months, but I've been doing yeah. this otherwise. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, blogger burnout mm -hmm. is a real phenomenon yeah. as well. So a lot of the, the stuff that we're involved in is actually trying to lessen the cost of involvement mm -hmm. in terms of time and commitment and everything mm -hmm. else to something that you can actually do on a regular basis as opposed to just that, that initial sprint of, wow, this is awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've got to go and you know do this other stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It's good you brought up blogs. So I've been keeping a blog for like four years and I've had those moments where I'm like, uh, and the thing that always brings me back is when I see comments from readers. So look what people are reading. Mm -hmm. So back to the organizational aspect, your organization has to give something back to the participant. And that's mm -hmm. when they feel appreciated, when they feel like they're learning something. Mm -hmm. So if you can give them specific skills, they'll, they'll, they'll take away. When you give them the passion for this, when you show them this, you know, instead of just saying, oh, why don't you guys get involved? It's like, well, you know, it's volunteering, right? Or it's something extracurricular, which is incredibly hard. And having been a volunteer, like, you need a certain kind of drive to keep you going. So I work in a school with students, and they don't care about journalism. And I'm a journalist, journalism teacher. So I'm thinking like, 
what is going to make them think this is important? Because they don't see it. Sometimes I tell them, guys, this can be published for the world. So this is something your peers can read. This is something you can put on your college applications. And there's other ways of saying, like, look, this got all these comments. It actually changed people's ways of thinking. So there's, you've got to really offer, this is what you're getting back from this. So you've got to have, like, volunteer recognition or, um, like, skill shares or something like that, where they walk away with, you know, very clear-cut things that they're not just going to hang out, that they're going to really get something out of it. Yeah. Um, I work in a community station that's also a student, like student run, but has a community member. Can you speak up a little louder, please? Sorry. I work in a station that's student run, but has a uh, 50 50 like, community involvement and uh, student you know, population engaged. And one of the ways that um, we battle, you know, come, come up against the like, students and you know, what their engage engagement with the radio as something that we just off campus hmm. is actually taking them off campus, like physically taking them out to like the outer lane areas of where our state proposed to, to like meet the communities that it, it, it actually talks to on a regular basis. Because I think sometimes with especially like stations that are based in colleges and universities, there's like a little bit of an island mentality that like, oh, we just do this thing and mm -hmm. it's just for us, but really um, kind of physically taking them out into the community hmm. towards whether that's doing like concert events or sponsoring, uh, you know, or like going to the farmer's market and broadcasting to the farmer's market, what, you know, whatever it mm. might be, um, just to kind of give them the, an idea of the physical presence that it has. Mm. I think the sustainability, well, go ahead, I want you to speak. Oh, I just wanted to follow up on that and say, in addition to, you know, what I've said before, some of the things that we feel like we get back from our station when we work with it is that there's this thing called a kiosk in the middle of the week where we can advertise our events for free. It's one of the only forums that my student organization can actually afford to advertise on. And we bring people out to our events by, you know, our community radio allowing us to have a little, like, blurb about, like, we're going to have a teach-in about sweatshops and, you know, whatever. So, I mean, that's, that's also a way to sort of offer an incentive for groups that help volunteers. Space. This thing about sustainability is really hard. Oh, did you have a, did you have a comment, sir, back there? No. Oh, okay. Oh. Okay. Whether it was when I was at WEFT as a volunteer, you know, um, or at where I'm at now in my, you know, in public TV and radio, um, this the idea is to build it within. I want to build it within the culture of the station. So if I leave, engagement still happens, which means that we're out there listening. We're saying, what did we hear from the community? And okay, let's do this story, or let's do that, or let's let's really focus on a much longer initiative like hunger and connecting people to resources. Uh, uh, I'll give you an example: Nine Network in St. Louis, which is TV, but they, you know, they literally help people save their homes from foreclosure because of the stories and the connection to organizations for people to keep their homes. They literally did. To me, that's the ultimate thing that we're going for. But, it, but in, if, if we just make decisions inside the building and don't have partners and aren't listening, we're going to be, our coverage is going to be less rich, obviously. Let me give you an example of something that happened recently. You may know that in this, um, here, we had some video released from a police's car, dash cam, that, um, that showed an arrest in campus town between a white officer and a black college student. And the IMC here published that video, got that video somehow. So what happened to us, this is what happened, the city manager sent us a press release on Saturday that said he was concerned about the video they saw on this police cruiser and they were going to have a press conference on Sunday. So we got that, so we went to the press conference and heard what was said and then we, um, the next we did a story on that, all right, that we didn't have the video. I think maybe they showed some of it. The next morning, we're calling the mayor to get his response, and he says, and I'm mad that the video got released. Oh, it got released where it was here on the UCIMC website. So we went to the website, we watched the video, and I called the team together. I said, okay, how are we going to describe this video? What are we going to say about this? It was like 27 minutes long. What are we going to do with it? Are we going to put it on our website? Are we going to point to the web? So, so, just, so basically, we, we did some stories. We talked a lot about how we're going to cover it, what language we're going to use. And then I was, I'm, I'm still on the, um, 
the uh, Senior Citizen for Peace and Justice listserv. I'm there listening to what's being said about this video. And I heard what was being said was other media were dropping off a key part of the description of this video. The way it was being described in media was the, the student was pepper sprayed. Other media had dropped off the fact that while the student was in the car handcuffed that the officer put his hands on his neck and pushed him back. And he was handcuffed. Now that got dropped from other media's coverage. And I, I was saying, well, how are we covering? Are we still saying both parts? And we, uh, we had also at some points dropped that other piece. So I called and I said, why, why are we doing that? What's, what's going on? And we had a conversation. And I'm not saying it was conscious, it was deliberate. Some of it had to do with time. But what I'm, so listening can be as formal as obviously having these sessions where we're actually out there. Or it can be, I'm listening to other points of view and bringing that back to those of us who decide what we're going to put on air or what conversations we're going to have or what events we're going to have. It all feeds in. And so my job is to continue to do that so that I think we have good coverage. Now, the other thing I want to say, which, which I did, there was a 10-week Citizens Police Academy that I joined to help my folks understand police work. I was in a 10-week session. And um, wow, I, I, I had another perspective that would have helped the way we covered that story. Because I went to a 10-week session, I just listened to what they had to present. So that's what I mean by a boundary-spanning organization. That's what, what we hope to be, that we're not take, we are not taking any one perspective, any one opinion. We are saying. We want you to feel like this dialogue can happen from different perspectives on our air or in our events, and then you get to decide what you want to do with that, but that you trust the content that we're creating, that it's fair, it's as accurate as it can be, and then do with it what you want. That's where I've come to, and to me, engagement is very much a part of the process of what we tell stories about and how we tell them. So Kim, um, in the interest of talking about concrete tips and tactics, when you look at your time and, and you're a busy person or busy people, um, how, how do you approach how you allocate your time when, you're, when, it, when it comes to some of this, soft, this work of relationship building and informing yourself so that you understand what's going on in communities around you? Do you, do you think about, about that or reflect on it? Yeah, well, my, actually, my, I have to, my title is Director of Community Content and Engagement. Okay. So <laughs> it's, it's, it, that's one of the things. Is by by re, restructuring and, and retitling my job, it says the organization, that's part of that institutionalizing the process. When you, when you, when you, and you put that in people's job evaluations. That how many community conversations were you at this year? Well, all of my reporters have to go to six a year. And, that, and, and because why? Because we want to be is open to different angles on the story as we can because that news hole, the reason we're not just a pass through NPR PBS station is because of our local content. That's what makes us different from others. And believe me, I think the PBS NPR content is awesome. Where else are you going to hear independent documentaries? I mean, that's the TV side, right? All these different viewpoints, they're like independent lens, point of view, that's great. Uh, a lot of the, at the NPR, we have more reporters overseas than any other network NPR does. But what makes us unique local to me is that engagement piece and the local content and being, and being part of um, events in the community that raise that issue a little bit higher. So you, you, you put it in job descriptions. People, yeah. during conversations about their evaluation during the year, you talk about this. Yeah. Um, does anyone ha in, the, in the crowd here, do you, do you, at staff meetings or volunteer meetings, do you talk and do planning when it looks like, like, like quarterly? Do you, do you plan like some of the specific things you're going to be going to, forums you're hosting, that, that kind of stuff? Is, I see some nods. Um, do, you, do you evaluate that? Uh, do, you, do you plan that in a, in a different way than like quarterly? Like I just want to hear some, some different ways of how folks yeah. do that planning, that intentional planning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, at least at our station, it, it goes along with the academic calendar. So, um, you know, at the beginning of the fall semester, at the beginning of the spring semester, and then um, we also have a summer session where we do our, our kind of planning for the ne like next full like academic year and what that's going to look like. And you know what? What what station are you at? Uh, WPRB. WPRB. 
And I'm going to start asking folks to say their station. I, I should have done that from the beginning uh, so that other folks here know where to find them. OK. Anyone else with um, some tips on, on how, how they do that? Well, so I work with a lot of new stations. So You're the Drupal guy, right? Sure. I'm oh, sorry. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, so on Sunday, uh, we'll be showing what the Channel Austin does and some of the things they use. But one of the things we use is calendar overlays. So they have a training calendar for the classes they're offering, but then they also suck in events from all different types of calendars that they overlay. So it's not shown publicly, but then they are aware of all the other events going on in the community. So if there is a film festival going on that weekend, it's probably not the best time to offer your only session until it's final cut for the month. So, uh, so that definitely helps with their planning to not offer something or do something at the same time. So is this a staff calendar? Um, it, they have staff vacation time there as well. But yes, it's a staff only view of, of uh, aggregated community calendars. Mm -hmm. So it's actually, the, the program actually goes out to these calendars and aggregates. It's right. not like a person most, who enters this? Most calendars now have feeds that you can plug into your Google calendar. So they're essentially mm -hmm. doing that for their own private internal planning use. Wow, cool. So, but that's all free and open. Mm -hmm. Very and useful. We'll show you how awesome. I'd actually like to add to that one thing, which is that it's not just about the events that are happening, but also in terms of forward planning for organizations, anniversaries are really important and follow-ups. So this might be the 30 days since this event happened. Let's follow up on it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this is uh, 10 years since that plane crash. This is you know any of any number of different events that that can actually be added to a calendar in a very practical way to say, okay, automatically, we just covered this story, but now let's set the clock for a follow-up. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, forward planning with the help of calendars is right on. Right. And, and it's, it, so City CRM is the tool that most of these stations use, and it has the ability to set reminders. So when you do, for anything, so if people attend an event and they get their contact information, group those people to set a reminder. Assuming you have someone who actually has the time to compose an email and do the outreach or make a phone huh. call or send a letter, um, then you can actually follow up on that. So you still need to, the software is going to do it. So general, general consensus, calendars are a useful tool. And, and using technology in these innovations. <laughs> um, other, other folks, how do you chunk out your, your time there, there was a semester. Look at it. Anyone in a in a non college situation? How how do you do that planning? Well, we have monthly meetings, and event planning meetings, and we have a community advisory board also that we get together. To, you know, pull on their diverse experience in the community to try to plug in places. So, um, do you also have set times for evaluating how how that went? Every month we evaluate the events from the previous month. Yeah, that's the first part of the meeting is feedback. Okay. Nan. Hello. I actually wanted to ask you, Kim, to talk a little bit more about the, um, the dental reporting because you said you did it for six months. Now, yeah. when you started, did you say, oh, we'll only do this for six months and then we'll stop? Did you say, we'll, we'll start and see how long it goes? Like we've done it for six months. That's the yeah. We have to go yeah. to another topic. I mean, this is a kind of a yeah. it was a community campaign. Yeah. It sounded like it had a big impact. It was very successful. Yeah. But it was finite. Right. Well, when we applied for the grant, which has really got us to look outward because of the obligations, that was really one of the first ways that my I, my orientation and thinking started to shift. We had to commit to six months or a year, so we committed to six months. Now. Because again, it was a formal grant, you know. Then, I mean, we've, but now we continue to cover that issue, informed through that six month intense collaboration with a partner, with actual dentists, actual kids who needed the care, so um, the Surgeon General's report. So, so when we cover it now, it's through that lens of that real shoulder to shoulder experience. But you've continued to focus periodically on this. You yes. haven't let the issue drop. We haven't let the issue drop. That's right. We'll do this highlight, this real intense thing, like those days of broadcasting I was talking to you about. 
and try to try to do that. Yeah. There was someone. The the thing that's hard is when we start as a broadcaster listening to folks. When we started to go in the community, they everyone approached us and said because there's so many untold stories, will you do this story, will you do that story? And we had to say, you know, we're first here to listen. We want to find trends, we want to find connections between what people are saying here and there and see if we can help tell the bigger picture for people. Um, and so people stopped asking us or thinking, the reporters had to have permission to know they can go to an event and not turn a story around the next day because they're listening for context, they're building relationship, building trust. And that was hard for a while. I'll give you another example. We um, were involved in, in just you know, anti-obesity efforts. If, you, if that's a health issue, that's a justice issue, that's a poverty issue, that's an access to care issue. I mean, it covers so many things, right? And for the first three years, we, we said to some organizations who publicly say, we are going to reduce obesity, we're going to increase health. We said, well, why don't we, would you like us to convene regular meetings, regular conversation with these organizations that are in the community doing this. And they said, yes, it's been four years. And part of what happens through that facilitating is hope. Because this is a daunting thing. The CU Public Health District has a plan, a five-year plan, obesity reduction, accidents, uh, reducing accidents, um, decreasing heart disease. That's all in there. How is that going to be realized without community support? The United Way creates reports of community needs. We access those things and we help other people see them. So when we decide what content we're gonna tell stories around, we have a much bigger picture of what's really going on, we think. At least it's bigger than we had before. And so for us, that helps us do our jobs better. It helps us stay connected. There is, I always give this analogy and it, usually people's eyes glass over and um, so maybe I need to find something else. But if you think of a fish, in a fish tank, a single fish. For me, storytelling, the reporting, documentaries, they're that fish. It's everyone can see the fish, but the environment, the water the fish is in, the air quality, the, the food, the, the, that fish isn't gonna survive if that water isn't healthy. So for me, engagement and listening is about the water in the fish tank. It's about the pathways to each other. It's about how is this community going? What stage is the community at? Is the community polarized an issue, around an issue? Is it um, open to new ways of relating to each other? If the media can tap into that, the storytelling is different, I think, if you're aware of that rhythm of the community. That's what I think. I'll give you an example. With the change in leadership with our police department here, um, and the fact that you know we went we had the this police thing, I think that one of the things that's come out of what I think can be healing and what media can contribute to is, if you take that video I mentioned, and I, you probably haven't seen it, there was such vastly different interpretations of the same thing. I think if we can build trust with the different communities who see this differently and have a conversation and model that, I think that is, can be catalytic. And I'm working to build relations with police we have relationships here already with the communities that are that are IMC Peace and Justice, and build that trust. The police don't necessarily trust us in our reporting. They're not my enemy. They're not my ally. They're a member of the community, just like anybody else. And if 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 we can span those boundaries and tell those stories, what happens next is could be incredible. So some of it's very intentional. It's saying we're going to listen first, tell stories second, and we're going to do this with other partners, and they're going to challenge our work. And then we're going to present it to the community, and what happens from there is up to the community. We are not, just like we, we are trying to not be a push model, we're also not trying to say we want this to happen. When I did activism work, I wanted a certain law to get passed, and I worked for that law and it got passed. I was part of a continuum of part. Now that I'm in the media the way I am, I see that, I see the role of media in the way I just described. And that to me is satisfying, and that's the role I'm in now, and I think that's an important service. So I'm happy to do that, and to talk about that, and, um, and that's what we mean by engagement. It's very much a deliberate, a thoughtful, stay with it kind of process. That's messy, it's really hard. You run into, no, we do it this way, no, we do it that way. You run into people challenging you and thinking they know what you do, or you thinking you know what they do. And it's about checking my assumptions and realizing that Mm, again, a big tent, multi-boundary spanning. That's, that's how I see it. I mean, there are people that wouldn't come on our air, public media, because they didn't think we were, we were hostile to them. Well, I, that's not how I want it to be. Yeah. Well, this is kind of a 
question for the group and off topic of that. Does anyone do remote broadcasting to try to engage the community? I take the radio to the people, you know, and make a coffee shop or whatever, do a town hall or even live broadcast of music events around town. Is a lot of that going on, and do people find that's effective? And um, do you to comment on it? Yeah, are any stations doing that? And uh, we do a lot of remote broadcast throughout the year uh, at KOP in Columbia, Missouri. We go to different speeches, like a 9-11 interfaith speech. We air that. We air our Earth Day celebration in the whole state. We have not gone into the um, shoutcast internet uh, alternatives. And the last time we set up our Marty, we it sounded like aliens had contacted us. <laughs> so, so we are in a stage of you know we really depend on that for our community engagement, and we are in a transition period. So you're moving to Shoutcast. We don't know if our Marty's completely lost or if it can be brought back to life. So we're trying to figure that out. Anyone we else doing September 9th? <laughs> Anyone else doing remote broadcasts? Yeah, KCSB we started doing more off-campus uh, live concerts. It's tricky to mix. I mean, we're trying to train ourselves how to do it right. Um, and uh, town halls, so more of that sort of thing. And, and I think that's really important to the future to create uh, awareness and interest. And what system do you use? Nicecast, Icecast. Uh, yeah. like we had to get, I mean, we, we even did some concerts a venue that had no internet, so we had to get a, a wireless card for it. And it it's all doable, mm -hmm. but then you have to kind of accept that it's not going to be perfect from the very beginning. And, uh, but we're trying to do more. I mean, more in studio uh, performances. It's it's like become make the station more of a hub, uh, more of a community center. Uh, that that's part of the mission. There, there, there. Okay. Uh, we have a, a film festival, huh? What oh, station? Radio Yetna in huh. Prague. Um, we have a film festival that's actually outside of Prague and outside of our broadcast range, but it's something that the community is really into. And so this film festival is something where we broadcast live pretty much continually during that week. And most of it is just done with Skype. Um, I mean, you know, why not, right? It's simple, and you just patch in, you know, patch in Skype, and, and there you go. And it works fine. I mean, originally we did it with phone, you know, just like a, a regular phone tie-in, but Skype is working great now. Yes? Uh, so we also broadcast, uh, like, festivals and stuff. I'm not exactly sure what the equipment we use is. WRT Madison. Thank you. Uh, but the one cool thing we tried about a year ago was we set up basically like we make shift radio stations in four different districts of Madison, so South, North, East, West, and advertised that we were going to have a live radio show at this location focused on whatever the we thought was like the most, the biggest issue at the time in that like part of town. And it actually, it was cool because it brought community members out to like the physical station that day that would have never come down to our actual station. So it got people involved, it got people face to face was sort of cool, but I don't actually know the numbers or any of the like specifics on how well that went, and I don't think we've tried it since, but. You bring up an interesting topic about impact and measuring impact. Mm -hmm. we'll, let's, let's table that for a second and hear what you have to say, and then we'll talk about that. Um, yeah, we partnered with um, this thing called Art All Night, which was a 24 hour um, festival in the downtown town of New Jersey, which is decidedly different from where the station broadcasts, which is in Princeton. And um, the first year, you know, we both, both like the organization and the radio station didn't really quite know how the partnering was going to work out. And now we're in our third year together doing that, and it's been very um, beneficial for both, both, like, both, of course, the station to be out and like have our DJs be in public and in public, and then also generate an excitement around the 24 hour arts festival. And, um, you know, it's fun to be up at, you know, 4 o'clock in the morning uh, broadcasting from the Yeah. Can I add one more thing about yeah. cool ideas in this area? 
one of the stations that I work with is a radio station in Weimar, Germany, uh, mm -hmm. called Radio Lotte. It's a community station, and what they did was they, they teamed up with some local makers, and they made a bicycle. And the bicycle was originally for like selling ice cream, but they put two turntables on it, <laughs> and and like the the mixing board and and the ability to go live from the this bicycle, and they just ride this bike around <laughs> town, and just check in. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and it's just great. <laughs> wow. Um, can can we get your email afterward and get sure pictures of that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> sure that. Oh, maybe we'll talk yeah. and I'll send yeah. it out. Okay. That's cool. <laughs> From television, one thing that uh, stations are doing is a company called LiveView.tv um, that essentially does the professional broadcast journalism uh, backpack satellite Kit, which is really just a device that has several commodity cell phones in it, and they pay for the service to connect 5, 10, 15 phones to all the different services and get you that bandwidth. They have been realizing that they've kind of maxed out that market for disaster reporting. They've been making smaller kits that uh, are available for community to use uh, with enough bandwidth <coughs> to cover high definition television. Uh, Channel Austin actually broadcasts uh, whatever the music awards. Uh, so it allowed them to, to broadcast from beyond their, their, uh, their normal reach. But it also, the city of Austin actually bought one of those units to make available to all of the community organizations in Austin that they work with. So it's something that different organizations can now check out and use for audio or video from remote locations that are using some of I've worked on lots of kinds of remotes over the, you know, low these many decades of broadcasting. And um, um, I wanted to mention just three different ones because I think it's it's important for people to realize one of the things that was brought up with the, you know, during the festival, remote broadcasts, unless your station is actually producing them, um, other, other organizations are producing them, they're not always designed for broadcasting. And that means whatever you think about community engagement or how the public is going to hear it or what your audience is going to get out of it, you really have to plan how to make it usable. And I mean that because, you know, just clicking in your microphone is not. Um, two broadcasts that WBAI in New York does every year, one is from the Clearwater Festival uh, up on the Hudson River, which is a folk festival. The second that they do every year is um, the Labor Day Caribbean Parade. There's there's like two million people. It's now the biggest parade in New York City. So you think about the difference between doing um, uh, a Pete Seeger sponsored folk festival on the Hudson River that's family friendly and that's take your picnic, or in the middle of Brooklyn, we have two million people watching this enormous parade of these loud, um, I don't mean noise, but I mean mm. loud pan bands, marching music, huge um, uh, floats and very colorful costumes and people screaming the whole time. Mm. <laughs> Producing those two broadcasts for community involvement is really, really difficult. Um, and having them comprehensible to the listeners who aren't here is really difficult. They can, you know, if they have to know what's going on. It has to be listenable to them. They have to want to be interested in it, not just for the people on site. Um, and the third event, I'm not even going to talk about like demonstrations because yeah, all of these have to be kind of managed for radio. The third event that I've been involved with, um, not recently, but quite a while, um, was broadcasting the big powwow from um, uh, the uh, Mashantucket Pequot annual powwow in Connecticut every year. A powwow was kind of like a county fair and um, uh, a big picnic and a community gathering and a, and a festival all kind of rolled into one. But it also has its own program. It's, it's mostly visual. It has some music, but it's mostly dancing and movement and things like that. And it's very important to the Native American community, and they understand it. But if you're trying to set that up for the radio, how do you make that understandable? How do you engage the Native community in a way that they appreciate what you mean? How do you engage non-Native listeners who don't have a clue what this means? So um, remote broadcasts, I think, are fabulous. I'm a big personal, big advocate for doing remote broadcasts. But you have to really plan them 
or even experiment, like sometimes it takes a few years to figure out how to do it well, or at least how to make it work. Because doing radio and doing events are just not the same, mm -hmm. and, and you have to make it work together. Mm -hmm. And the person doing the event might say, we're going to do our event, you know, you do whatever you need to do, but we can't change what we're doing for you, so you have to work around it. Um, and the technology has made a lot of that stuff much easier. I think it's true. I mean, I'm here to somebody who's a Marty, but those microwave frequencies probably aren't even around anymore. Use, uh, use the Marty, which are basically little remote transmitters to send the signal back to your station. Um, so I think the technology gives us lots of opportunity, but it doesn't change the, need, change the nature of what it means for us to leave the studio and work with another group to do the radio. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I don't work for a radio station, I'm an organizer in Detroit, but I'm aware of a lot of different media um, organizations in Detroit that are operating like what's being talked about. And many different organizations such as Detroit Future Youth, Detroit Future Media, um, Detroit Future School operate off of the principles of environmental justice. So in terms of like an off-site event or whatever, it's more so does the community want this? Um, how does the community want to broadcast it? And those are ingrained principles within these organizations. So going back to the idea of the engagement to find the narrative or the narrative to find the engagement. I think that the environmental justice principles of these organizations are operating on are really key to that Yep. Good point. Uh, as we're wrapping up here, we've got mm, just about 10 more minutes. Um, is there anything that, that folks really wanted to hear or talk about that we haven't talked about yet? Yes. Uh, Russell from uh, uh, CKDU Radio in Halifax. Uh, we have a lot of, of great uh, community-based programming uh, with, with different uh, groups in our, in our community. Um, but where we're falling short is connecting with groups that may not have a cohesive organization themselves. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's very easy for us to go to, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, Greek community uh, because they have uh, a cultural association. We can approach them and say, we would like to have your voices on, on our airwaves. But there are a number of disenfranchised groups in, in, our, in our city that don't have that uh, formal community. How do you connect with those groups? Are these, can I ask a few uh, about a few attributes of these groups? Are, are these groups that convene any any kinds of meetings or gatherings? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm looking specifically at uh, uh, the, the African Nova Scotian population in, in Halifax, which is, is significant, but uh, they they don't have a, a, a I guess a cultural association. Um, there's but, a, there's a, a Black Business Association. Yeah. Uh, but beyond that, um, uh, there, there aren't a lot of other, I guess, sort of formal networks. Well, I'm, I, I have some very specific ideas for you because I am familiar with that community in Halifax. Um, but like just what comes to mind, and this could be replicable other places, but like in Uniac Square, a, a housing project, there is a youth media program. And those folks are very well connected. Uh, there's the Africaville uh, celebration that happens every, every summer. Which we have uh, uh, broadcast. Right, exactly. And then the Historical Society. The, you know, like I'm just trying to think of any kind of something that you can talk to the folks who organize it, or um, you know, like it sounds like you're already broadcasting from the um, the summer celebration uh, yeah. or the picnic, rather. Okay, yeah. um, but that, that's a great question. Does anyone have any tips? Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. Find an outspoken person mm -hmm. that you can <laughs> talk to them. They know who yeah. 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 Right. I found that whenever we've done something that, like, is uh, what we're trying to get an underrepresented voice on, and it, that voice doesn't represent those of us who work at the station, if we show openness, the best partnerships I've had is when someone from a community that's not represented by our station, for example, comes to us because they realize we're open and proposes something. They're saying to us, we want to do this. And then we can say yes or no based on what we, our resources are, what our philosophy is, whatever. So for me, that's some of the best projects have come when that, again, just being at events, listening, and then someone noticing, oh, really? 
you know, it's either an invite or sometimes that comes to you as an invite. So I think it, it's worked both ways. talk to, but a lot of places that's um, overlooked many times is churches are usually are involved with in organizing the community, yeah, especially in African American communities that find some people um, that work within the church and they, uh, Yeah, I think uh, other community institutions, if you will, places where folks get their hair done, uh, restaurants that serve certain communities. These are pretty informal yet public spaces where you could strike up some conversations or tell folks. Um, looking at impact and measuring impact. This is something that I'm a little new to uh, in the past when I've evaluated things, projects. You know, I, I go with the qualitative, the stories, you know, finding those good stories that really capture what happened there, photo documentation. Uh, and some numbers, but who knows what, I, I've never had to write a grant for this kind of thing, or I have had to justify it, um, but uh, does, does anyone have, have some things like that? And, and I will preface, uh, or, or I'll kind of kick off to say um, I'm not endorsing Gates Foundation, but very recently uh, they convened Ford Foundation and Knight and a few others. Um, and they've, they've been really trying to get on the same page about measuring impact, so I think that's kind of interesting. And I do have some resources about that, but I'm also looking for other resources of folks you know, who've, who've, who've been thinking hard about that. And you're nodding your head a lot. I was wondering if you had no, something. It's interesting, like, if you, are you talking about like, more in terms of, wait, are you talking more in terms of like, measuring what audience impact is, or are you talking about fundraising impact, or like, what, like, which, like, mm -hmm. Like what kind of uh, very specifically, uh, the example of what, what Kim did with the dental project, I, I think she had some very clear outcomes, some, some very good qualitative outcomes as well as some numbers and you could really map like what happened because they convened that, that community conversation and that focus. I have an example. Yeah. Um, and it's going to be talked about at the youth panel that I'll be on with Tatiana and some other folks tomorrow. But when, you know, when we worked with, you know, a lot of times when we work with youth, they want to see, you know, are they going to graduate? Are their grades going up? Do they have less DNRs? You know, you know that kind of stuff. And so some of what we were trying to measure, we were trying to think that by building relationships with youth and working with them and using media as the hook, that into their lives and, and, and to empower them to produce, not just consume. Um, you know, there are a lot of funders that want to see very, like, like I said, they're great. It's, oh my God, it's so hard as a media organization to say to the teachers, okay, and get their parents to sign the permission slip. Yes, you can see my child's grades and yes, you know, and then you're, you, how do you know it's really true? Did you have a, well, before you were involved, did you have a measure of how they're doing now? Do you have a measure after your involvement so you really have a real sample? Like, oh my God, we're not gonna be able to do that. But what we can say is, look, these kids came in, we knew what their skills were, and now look at the media they produced. They produced this radio documentary, they interviewed 15 people, they had never talked to someone who was an adult outside of their family, ever. That's an achievement. They never knew how, oh, I didn't realize that when I'm videotaping this or doing that, I have to be around, uh, the refrigerator went off. Okay, now they know that, unplug the fridge when you're doing an interview. These are very concrete things we know were an impact of our work together with them because they didn't have the skills now and now they have them and they demonstrated it. And that critical thinking part, whether it's adult or child, media literacy, that is huge in my opinion, huge, huge, huge. I mean, there's so many more ways to call fire in a theater with social media. Who's gonna know if that is really a fire? Who's gonna know that video was real or that story, you know what I mean, that credibility. So for me, impact is, A, they can demonstrate skills that they didn't have before. Some of them are tangible, like a product, an air product or a CD or a DVD, or a website or a blog. But some of it is, I, I, a lot of what I do with young people is, when I see them grow, I, I, I say, you know what, you just, you just that's critical thinking. You just, this is what you did. You took these two things together and you mashed it up and you analyzed it. And, and I helped them see how they just grew. And so for me, I mean, it can be as 
like one-on-one, -on -one, or it can be huge study where before they came into your program, they were like this, now afterwards they're like this. And a lot of funders you know, want those hard numbers. But I think impact is that range. It depends on what you want to measure. i just add to that that there's, um, the Search Institute has put out um, something that they call developmental factors. And there's a fair amount of evidence when you're dealing with youth that the, these uh, developmental assets are tied to um, how much risk behavior, kid, high risk behavior kids get involved with and stuff like that. And they're very concrete and they can be used in evaluation. So you can, for example, one of them is, do you have any kind of a relationship with an adult? Um, another one is, are you doing um, music uh, three times a week? Um, are, you know, so these are very concrete, but the thing that I think is useful about them for um, grant writing is that it, a, a funders have, have in large accepted that those things that are fairly easy to measure are then tied to things that are very hard to measure, like the number of at-risk behaviors, the uh, number of people that graduate from high school, all those kinds of things. So if you can get to those intermediate variables and the funders will accept them, that becomes an easier way. Some of it can just be done with self-report, so you don't have to have the, the mm -hmm. parents' permission. Yes. You can just say, um, and uh, I've worked with technology, and, and in technology, you can ask somebody, you know, well, how good are you with computers? And then you ask, and they say, well, I'm pretty good, you know? And then you do a program and you ask them again, and they say, well, I'm pretty good, you know? Um, they, they don't realize how much they don't know until they get to the end of the mm -hmm. thing. So that the, the way of dealing with that is to do what they call a post-retrospective. So you say, at the end of the program, you ask them, how much now do you know about this? And then you ask them, how much did you know about this when you started the program? Mm -hmm. And then they're working on the same basis. And the, 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 and actually the demand characteristics, if, if you get into the jargon of the uh, assessment, are working in your favor, whereas otherwise they're working against you uh, in terms of trying to show something. That was good. Just quickly, we do a pre-survey interview and then a post. So we don't do it at the same time. We do one before they get in the program. But yeah, that's the, that's a good measure. Yes. Uh, to off what you were saying, part of the three There's these measurables that need to be included in grants, and there's so many things that are not measurable. Um, I guess an example in Detroit, it's not so much skill set sharing, but it raises a positive story. I know we can take it out. Is that there's tremendous amounts of school closures in Detroit right now, and in Southwest Detroit, which is a primarily Latino community, there's a high school. So the students through blog, radio, and YouTube videos broadcasted their story of what was happening. They got suspended from the high school from the state. They, 150 people were suspended from the high school. Um, you only got to slam from the major newspaper. Yeah, yeah, well, and through blog, radio, and um, their videos, they set up a freedom school in the community park outside and brought in this measurable for adults because it was community building for the rest of the community. And I think so often it's only looked at the impact of the teens and children. What about their impact on the rest of the community? And that's not something that can be measured in the brand. Yeah, to, to wrap up, um, I, I think it's great to end on a really inspiring story. Uh, Detroit Future and its three segments, uh, that they have a great web presence, and folks are pretty active on social media with that, too. Um, so I really encourage you to go check that project out specifically, because it is so darn inspiring. Um, part Detroit Future, and it's Detroit Future Media, Detroit Future Education, and what's the third? Um, so uh, there's so much more to talk about with this, and I really appreciate how all of you have been so so generously participating. Uh, and thanks for rolling with our one more thing. Oh, it's yes. Sabrina's birthday today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a total birthday princess, so thank you for that. Um, Okay. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Go eat some food. <laughs> <laughs>
I've mentioned that bike with the remote bike. I po I posted a picture of it to the Twitter feed. Oh. Um, so if you want to see it, it's up on the Twitter feed now. It's awesome. That's so cool. Okay, awesome. awesome. Thank you. Oh goodness. Ow.